So I'm on my way to deliver a brand new Super Titan I built for a 1975 Corvette. It's a conversion from automatic to stick. So I supplied all the parts, the clutch, the shifter, the whole setup for them. I'm really anxious about this because I'm very curious as how this is going to drive when it's all completed and done. Oddly enough, I did have a 75 Corvette at one time and did the same exact thing, converted it from an automatic to a stick, and actually went out and got a four-speed frame for the car and built the whole thing up. Four-speed frames on Corvettes are different than automatic frames. For those of you who don't know, it's a much more difficult car to work on because the cross member is welded to the frame. It's not removable. So it's very hard to get the whole transmission up into the car as well as install the shifter. Now, if you're doing an auto to stick conversion, the cross member is removable, obviously, because the transmission is much larger than a four speed. Now, this what's cool about this is that if you leave the automatic cross member in the car, it makes it much easier to install a transmission and install a transmission with the shifter aligned. So the plan is I should be arriving there as they have yanked out the automatic and we're getting ready to now install all the new stuff and we'll see how that goes. So there was an automatic in place where this was, right? Yes, the and, automatic was here. And uh, we have like the removable cross member mounts. Yes, yeah, bolt-in removable cross member going across here. Everything is the same as far as the drive shaft and the yoke on this 400. So it's really easy to do then? Yes, and once you get the transmission out, you put your pilot bushing in, put right. your new flywheel on, a different starter, and start with your bell, your clutch and your bell housing next. You were saying that the 10 and a half inch clutch was used on the LTs, so that's right. why we put the 10 and a half inch in here. Yes. So you got all this foam stuff is in there, it's all in good shape? Yep, it's all in good shape. We'll put this right back, back up in the hole. So how long do you think it's going to take you to put everything in now? You mean the clutch will probably take about a half an hour. Okay. The clutch Sounds good. You got it balanced too, right? Yes. We'll it's, surf it's surface and balanced to match. So they surface and balance, surface even though it's a new clutch. Yes, balance the flywheel, the, mm. the flywheel assembly. And balance individually, separately, and then balance this uh, clutch to match right here like this on the balance marks right here. And that's where it, where it has to be. goes back together in one position. This is pretty much your standard procedure on any clutch job you do. Yes, we and always surface and balance the two assemblies because it stops the vibration in the car. You still feel there's still vibration even with stock clutches. Oh, yeah. yeah it's like all that. out of rhythm. Yeah. Some are out a lot. All right, we're running a Santa Force uh, 2 standard clutch, organic lining, yeah. like that. Uh, Santa Force, it's been a great clutch. We've been using these for a long time. Right. Very happy with it. Awesome. And the, and the oak is in good shape? Yeah. yeah I would just kind of like scuff it up maybe, clean yeah, it up. Clean like it up and yeah. good. Yeah, go we get... just got it apart a few minutes ago. So. so why don't you go ahead and tell them about the transmission that you just built okay, while I'll I put do... this together. Okay, I'll okay. do that. Thanks. So about a year and a half ago, I did a disassembly video for a Super T10 4-speed. A lot of people have been wondering, when am I going to do the assembly video? Well, this is that video. I know it's taken a year and a half to do that, but sometimes, to be honest with you, jobs can't be sitting around and I can't be editing videos all day long. I have to get these jobs in and out for people. Their cars are waiting. They might be on a lift someplace and the job just has to go out the door. This time I had a little bit of time to fool around, try to get some good footage for you. It's going to be a really cool setup. I think we're going to like this because I'm going to go through the whole build-up process and then get it in the car and take it for a drive. How cool is that? Let's go check this out. So most people are going to be buying a rebuild kit to build this transmission. This is a rebuild kit I put together. It's got the gaskets and seals, all the small parts, needle bearings, snap rings and thrust washers, synchronizer rings, strut keys and springs, extension housing bushing. I use sealed bearings in my kits. One thing I want to tell you is that in the small parts packs that you get from people, they'll have the thrust washers in it, main drive needles, countershaft needles, 
But the other thing is, is they'll have these thrust washers. You'll see this in all these kits that are advertised on the internet. And these thrust washers, by the way, are made out of steel. They're not really good washers. So I substitute the Super T10 thrust washers with these bronze nipple washers that I actually use in the Muncie's. They work fine. When you get a kit from me anyway, you're going to be getting these bronze washers in it for the Super T10. Some Super T10s have these types of needle bearings and thrust washers for the reverse idler as opposed to this particular washer for the reverse idler in the extension housing. There's actually another one. There's a third type of washer and cup that is no longer available. So please do not throw any of those washers and cups away on your extension housing. So these are the only ones that are available. These two thrust washers again and the roller bearing and a single washer over here. Everything else is pretty straightforward. You get a brand new counter shaft in the kit. Again, gaskets and seals, bushing, and you even get some detent balls and springs in the kit. So that's all you really need to put together a transmission if you just want to go through it. And let me show you now something about synchronizer hubs. This is a 3-4 synchronizer hub, and I want you to notice that it has a groove ground into it. And when they grind this groove, it actually discolors the hub and makes a kind of a blue mark to it. And some people think that the hub is overheated for some reason and it's defective. But in reality, they just cut this groove in it and it created a heat mark on it and that's normal. So these hubs are usually in good shape. However, you can see that this hub has got some slight wear to it. It wasn't as hard as it should be. So when you see the hubs and you see the splines like this hammered, you need to change the, the hub out. Now the new hubs don't have that groove in it anymore. I think that possibly that groove was for identification purposes and I'll tell you why. You see, on some of the early synchronizer assemblies, this is an early hub, they might look the same, okay? But there is a difference in the depth of the key slots over here. So you have to be very careful when you're building T10s because these early stamp keys work with this type of slot which was a little bit shallow, okay? So this thing would fit in the slot like this. And you can actually use these keys in the later hubs even though it's deeper because the spring will support it. But these particular keys, these solid strut keys, are used in the hubs with the deeper groove. And if you put them in this particular groove, you can see that it fits below the spline. Biggest mistake people make is they might not realize they have a mixed match of parts and they'll put in an early hub and with one of these keys and now you can see that this thing is sitting above the spline so it'll lock the slider up. See that? So when it comes to assembling the Super T10 synchronizer assemblies, it's quite obvious that the splines are different for the 3-4 assembly and the 1-2 assembly. It's important to note that both of these hubs, the protruding portions face towards the front of the transmissions. On the 3-4, slider goes on like this. The tapered edge facing towards the front. And on the 1-2, the taper faces towards the back. So if you look at it this way, flat portion of the hub, the tapered side faces. This is going to be where the first gear bushing goes in. Now when it comes to assembling the synchronizer assemblies, you can simply just lay the keys in like this. You can use grease to hold them in place if you prefer. And then drop the slider on top of it. Usually I'll make sure that the sliders and the hubs have no burrs on them. Now you can sneak the spring underneath one key and push them up with your fingers like this and catch them. Now notice where this tang is on the spring. You're gonna flip the assembly over. So now the spring is going this way on the other side. Just put the spring in the same way here, using the same key. So you're going to have a balance of the springs. One spring is going this way, other spring is going this way. The same thing for three, four. Sometimes you can sneak the keys in, like this. There's more room on the three, four to do that. Same thing, tang here, same key, flip it over, tang in the spring on the same key, catch everything. Make sure your action is good, nothing is binding, and both assemblies are ready to go. So I've got this whole gear train laid out, first, second, third, with the synchronizers fit on. 
Synchronizer assembly is all ready to go. The reverse gears, counter gear is loaded with the needle bearings. Main shaft is over there. I just wanted to show you the mid plate. Because I'm running sealed bearings in the front and the back of this transmission, I will drill a hole in the mid plate. Two holes over here, one hole on the bottom over here. Because when you have this thing filled up, the oil level is going to be right about here. And with a sealed bearing, there's no way for the transmission to actually breathe properly. So I put these holes through the mid plate so that both cavities, in other words, the extension housing and the front case, can vent properly. It's a little idea that I do, but the Muncie's I have this actually cast into the mid plate. So what we're first going to do is put the rear retaining snap ring in the mid plate. And this snap ring fits pretty good. We're going to get some pliers in here and spread that snap ring open and get this bearing started in the, the bore. These fit kind of loose, so you can just tap it gently. Once the snap ring closes, bearing's in the mid plate. That's ready to go. So I put some lubricant on the main shaft. I'm going to put the second speed gear and the synchronizer ring on the main shaft. Spin it around, make sure it feels good. Then I'm going to put the 1-2 synchronizer assembly in place. Make sure that the protruding side of the assembly is facing towards second gear and the flat side of the assembly is facing towards the back. Now sometimes on these new assemblies I'm finding that they're a little bit tight. So, sometimes they'll drop in, sometimes they need to be pressed in. And this is definitely going to have to be pressed in. So we'll just get it started and seated and get it a little square on the spline. What I'll do is I'll take the first gear sleeve and press it on the press. These are very tight. So we're just going to just start this and get it square so we can get a good press on the piece. Okay, the first gear sleeve is on the bearing splitter. Synchronizer assembly is laying against the first gear sleeve. I got the synchronizer ring indexed in the keys and the one two hub is already started on the spline. So I should be able to just kind of start pressing down now gradually, very slowly. And then that sleeve will contact the hub and actually aid in getting the hub on the shaft. This hub is a nice press fit. So I'm gradually bringing it down, making sure that, of course, nothing is going to catch on anything. It's very critical because you can actually bend the ring if you catch it wrong. So I'm always constantly making sure that I'm going to catch the ring on the gear properly. Once I kind of see that the ring is on the gear, I can let the gear drop down and then finish with the press. Now the hub is going to bottom out on the spline and we should end up with a little clearance between the second speed gear and the flange. Okay, it stopped. This is the normal clearance we have. It's perfect. So now we're going to put the first gear on here with this first gear synchronizer ring. And this bearing over here is going to press onto this portion of the main shaft. Now sometimes they'll just drop right in. Sometimes they could go on there a little snug. But I think on these new ones, pretty much they're very tight. So just put some lubricant here. Put the ring down first, let it engage the key slots. And put the gear down. That fits very nice. What you'll notice here is that the first gear sleeve is slightly higher than the first gear itself. And that's your end play for clearance. If the first gear is actually higher than the sleeve underneath it, it's going to bind up on the rear bearing. So it's always got to be lower. So that's something to check. If you have a worn synchro hub, it's possible that this could end up 
going down further than the first gear and you can lock the unit up. There's a thrust washer that goes on here, you see, like this. And what you'll notice is that that washer, when it's down here, there's a little play. And that's your oil clearance for the first gear. That's all it takes. So once you drop this in place, you could take a punch and a hammer like this and kind of just tap it to see if it's going to be too tight or drop down. And this is way too tight. This is going to have to be put on the press as well. So because I'm going to have to press this, I got to use something suitable to be obviously higher than this. So I've got an old bearing race over here I'm going to use. Put that down like that and then put the clamps underneath it like this. So what I got going on here is I got that bearing race supporting that bearing. I've got the plate against that. Notice that the first gear is hanging low. I have to make sure that when this comes up in, into position that I catch that synchronizer within the keys. So what I like to do is, if possible, kind of catch it already and hold it in place as I start pressing. Normally, you won't have to do this with your transmission. That's good. Very nice. So you want to make sure that you have this gap over here. You see the way the spline is starting over here? That's because the spacer goes on. These are 62,000 spacers that slide on here. Usually I find that you kind of measure the snap ring, you put it in the groove. This fits pretty good. This is an 87,000 thick snap ring. There's several different size snap rings as far as the thickness goes. So again, making sure that the spacer is seated. I'm going to use an 87,000 thick snap ring. These can twist really easy, so you kind of have to really catch them square and walk them down the main shaft. Always look at the snap ring, spin it around, make sure that it's seated in the groove because sometimes snap rings have burrs and it's permissible to just take a little punch, tap it into place. Make sure it's seated in the groove. The rear reverse gear just slides in place on the spline. Now we have to put the speedometer gear in place. This snap ring that goes on here speedometer gear and another snap ring. The speedometer gears come in several different colors. Blue gear is an eight tooth gear, then there's a green gear that's a seven tooth gear, and a white gear that's a nine tooth gear. So now what I'm doing is I'm making sure that I can actually fit another snap ring in the groove again because these snap rings are selective. Try to get the thinnest ring to fit in here. That works. Now if you're rebuilding your own transmission, there's really no need to change these unless you've overstretched them. Use the ones that you have. Again, the same thing, take a punch, just make sure it's seated in the groove. Not that there's a big load on this anyway. So the back side is all done, second gear all the way to the speedometer gear. The next step is simply to be putting in the third speed gear and the third speed synchronizer assembly. Now, sometimes these just slide on. Hopefully, this won't have to be pressed on. We're not going to be able to put this in a press, but it seems kind of loose. So, again, you have to just keep it square on the spline. Just take a punch a little bit and punch it down slightly. And then once it's down, where you feel you can catch the ring and the keys. You see what I did here? 
the three key slots of the ring are now engaged with the keys in the assembly. I can drive the rest of this home. So what I want to do is I want to put a snapping in here that's going to give me a little bit clearance so that I can actually tap this back a little bit and get a little bit of end play on third speed gear. And this particular snap ring is 82 thousandths, which is the smallest snap ring. There was the thinnest snap ring in the kit. So we're going to use this one, put this in place. Again, making sure that my direction of my snap ring is correct. If you watch my first video, I go into that. So what I'm going to do now that it's situated, I'm going to just take a soft hammer. This is a soft, call it malleable iron hammer. Just tap it a little bit to get that snap ring seated back this way and get a little bit clearance on third gear here so it spins nice and free. So now that we got this main shaft assembly completely together, I just wanted to point out a few things. Notice that the taper of the 1-2 slider faces towards the back of the unit and that the taper of the 3-4 slider faces towards the front. Sometimes people have a tendency to get things backwards. The other thing is, is the hubs underneath of these two assemblies, both of the protruding edges of the hubs face forward this way. So this is a brand new extension housing. Even though it's brand new, I still want to take a file and make sure that none of the edges have burrs on them so that the bushing will not hang up when I'm pressing it in. It's a good idea to also do this on your used extension because when you press the old bushing out, you may rip up a little metal, so make sure it's all clean so the new bushing seats correctly. It looks pretty good. You want to make sure that the, the locking surface of the bushing is nice and smooth. There's no rough spots on the bushing so that it will not bulge out when you press it into the extension housing. All right? So I just go over with a file and I just make sure there's no high spots on the bushing. Clean up the edges. I'll take this anaerobic Loctite. It's basically a gel thread locker. And I'll put it on the bushing. This is red super high strength thread locker, but it's a gel. And I like to coat my bushings with this gel before I press them in for a little extra insurance that they're not going to spin in the case. I'm going to install the bushing with the puzzle lock opposite the return hole. So it's going to go in like this. And I'm going to do this on the press. So you got the bushing all in, and I just clean up any burrs from pressing it in, make sure it's nice and smooth. Then I'll take a yoke and I'll put it in, make sure it fits nice, which it does. Bushing's installed. Okay, you have to grease the seal before you install it. Greasing seals is very important because during initial fire up, the rubber isn't running dry against the drive shaft yoke. And also the grease actually keeps the little spring that holds tension on the seal in place so that when you're driving the seal in, the spring won't pop out. That's an old trick, so always grease any type of seal that you have to keep that spring from falling out. Now because these particular seals are precision seals and the ends are ground, we have to put a little bit of sealant on the outside of it. Like this. In normal applications, the reverse idler shaft is already pre-installed in the extension housing. So if you see, you've got this hole in the idler shaft and you've got this hole in the extension. You simply have to drive this roll pin into the extension housing and catch both the extension housing and the idler shaft. 
A lot of the factory units are now just covered with sealer, but I actually put in a quarter inch cup plug and seal it properly. It's kind of like a loose fit, and you kind of bring it in until I see it line up with the hole in the extension. Now you want to make sure that you've got the roll pin into the case and also into the extension and enough room for the plug to go in there and seal everything up. That looks good. So I got this little tiny quarter inch Welsh plug and I'm going to just coat it with sealant and drop it in there. So we're going to put the reverse idler shift shaft in. I grease the spring to hold it in place and I grease the ball. And I grease the shaft and start sliding it in. Now I have a pry bar that I use to push the ball down. Now a lot of times if you push this out too far, the ball can jump out. So make sure you don't push this, this far, too far out but it seems to be in there good. Then you want to put the O-ring on this outside piece over here and then push it back in. There's a tapered portion of the extension housing that allows you to push it in without cutting the O-ring. If you notice, I've left the O-ring out so that I can get the shaft in without ruining the O-ring. Since the tail is getting prepped for final assembly, I'll put the reverse shift fork in there as well. Make sure it spins nice and easy. Everything's free. So you apply some grease onto the reverse shift the shaft and slide the O-ring seal over the threads carefully and into the groove. Once we engage that fork on the gear, then we're going to push this in. And again, this is tapered in the inside so the seal won't get ruined. I forgot to mention that on this YouTube channel, I actually have a video on how to install needle bearings in the counter gear. It's a video I did on a Muncie 4 speed, but the Muncie and the T10 are exactly alike. Check out that video. There's a link up here and there's one of these cards and also in the description below. So when it comes to loading needle bearings in the counter gear, you got the spacer tube in the middle. You're going to have one of the tiny little spacer rings on either side of the tube. A row of needle bearings, a spacer, a row of needle bearings, and a spacer. You duplicate the same thing on both ends. In other words, spacering against the tube, row of needles, spacer, row of needles, and spacer. Unlike the Muncie four speeds that I build, the counter gear going back together on this one is going to be actually put in position. You can keep the counter gear dropped, but I'm going to tell you right now it requires some special technique and fixturing to really get the counter gear in correctly. So counter gear is all loaded with all the needles. And I'm going to just drop it in place like this. Going to put the rear thrust washer in. Make sure my tanks are in the right positions. Now these counter shafts have a Woodruff key. And you're going to catch that Woodruff key in the slot in the case. So first we start the counter shaft into position. Make sure it's going through where we need it to get. 
you have to catch the front of the case first. So you got to make sure your alignment is really good with the key slot. Like that. Make sure it starts in the front of the case. Key slot is good. And what I'll do is I'll just give it a little bit of a tap. Just to seat it. Make sure it's started. I'll get that key ready to go in here. Feels nice. Let's put this aside for a second. Okay, so I got my needle rollers. I put some assembly lube already in the input shaft, and you're just going to be packing the needles in the input. I use this trans gel assembly lube, and again, the reason why I use it because I'm in Florida and it's usually pretty hot in the shop, and this stuff kind of maintains its tack throughout the rebuilding process. It keeps the needles in place. You just pack it really good. Now you want to make sure you put this needle bearing thrust washer in place and catch the input shaft. What I usually do is I'll check. I'll make sure that everything is there again, that the needles haven't fall down. And we're catching the synchronizer ring in the key slots of the assembly. So I kind of support the case tilted forward with a simple block of wood. I'm going to put in the forward reverse idler thrust washer. Stick it in place. Put the, reverse, the forward reverse idler in place. Let it just hang out there for a bit. We got on the back of the case. I just put the gasket on there with some sealant. Let it stick in place. And I'm going to just guide this whole gear train right into the transmission. The object here is not to allow the input shaft to come back out again. So what I do sometimes is I'll just try to catch the front bearing first even. So the big mistake a lot of people make is that if this input shaft kind of falls forward, it could disconnect and catch the needles. So I try to at least catch the mid plate in the case first, just the guide bolt on the bottom. I'm doing this just to kind of hold the plate in place, okay, while I work on the front a bit. Now these new input shafts, through my suggestion, I had Richmond gear ease up the fits a little bit on the bearings so they slide in better. So you can gently tap these bearings in or heat them up, but we can't really heat this bearing up because it has a rubber seal in it, but it'll go right in. Now you might not be able to do this on the older Super T10s, but this was the process and this is how it was supposed to be done. So now we'll put that 60,000 spacer in. This looks like an 87,000 stick snap ring. This is, the kit has a lot of 87,000 stick snap rings. 
Looks like that's going to fit just perfect. Now again, sometimes you have burrs on these, so permissible to just kind of tap the snap ring in place a little bit. Now again, very important that you use the snapping in the small parts kit. Notice that the standard snapping on the bearing is a little bit wider here than the snapping that comes in the small parts kit. This is the correct size snapping for the Super T10. It's got a little bit of a thinner cross section. I'm going to just slap on the bearing retainer right now just to hold everything in place with a couple of bolts so I can work on it facing down and put the extension housing on without the front falling out. This bolt is just a little bit loose to hold that plate in place as I said. And I wanted it loose because I'm going to drive in that locating dowel again. So the locating dowel press fits to the mid plate and kind of just hangs out in the main case. So what we want to do is just leave about a quarter inch worth of height so it catches the case and the mid plate. So I'm going to take this out now and put some Fred Locker on and then torque it down to 45 foot pounds. You should inspect the reverse idler for chips and cracks on the gears. Uh, these gears are very critical. If you have a busted tooth, it's going to kick itself out of reverse. So make sure the reverse gears are nice and clean. This is a brand new reverse idler. All the reverse idlers, when they're new, do not come with a snap ring on them. Do not get rid of your old snap ring because they're not in small parts kits. So take your snap ring off your old gear and put it on the new gear or leave it alone. But again, they're not in the small parts kits. I don't know why. I haven't seen them in them for years. Snapping is important because the forward reverse idler butts up against it. Like this. Without that, it'll just come through and hit first gear. So it's really important that that's there. Next step is to lay that reverse idler in the case. The Super T10s have a tendency to leak right over here because unlike the Muncie 4 speed, which has a little bit stronger case arrangement, these two lower bolt holes don't through bolt into the main case. And as a result, if you over tighten them, what you could end up doing is buckling this and bending this and the oil will dump out of the mid plate. So I kind of just dress this plate up with a file. In case you're wondering, I'm using the Dynatex Anaerobic Gasket Maker number 49477. What I like about anaerobic gasket makers is that once they make contact, they start to set up. So the setup is almost fairly instantaneous once there's pressure applied. Just want to go over a little explanation about some of the differences in the rear reverse idler thrust washers. Old systems had a simple thrust washer that had a tang in the back of it that locked into a recess in the tail housing. This particular tail housing is a new tail housing and doesn't take this type of washer. There's another washer that I don't have that has a steel cup that fits inside here in a bigger area and then a round roller bearing that fits into that steel cup. I don't have that one. 
The newest ones have basically a flat thrust washer that goes on like this, a flat roller bearing that goes on, and then another flat washer that goes on like this. Now, sometimes you can use this particular setup if you need to modify existing extension housings or some of the old cup type extension housings, this setup will work in place of that. So these three pieces are the new style and what we're going to use today. So how I'm going to put this on is I'm going to catch the reverse idler shaft into the reverse idler. I'm going to catch this fork into the reverse gear, push this into the reverse gear, and then push the whole thing down. So lift this up, I'm catching the idler, I can feel that I've caught, see I'm rotating the extension housing like this so I can catch the, the reverse gear. You don't want to push this in too much, just enough. And with this finger now I'm lining up the washer. <laughs> There you go. That's looks easier than it is, trust me. <laughs> I try to make sure everything is flat before I start even bolting it in place. Torquing these bolts down to 30 foot pounds. So I push the Shift the shaft down in place, make sure it's all seated. Going to put a little sealant on the tapered pin. Put a little sealant on the bottom of the hole here. The pin will push it back out. So just like my Muncie 4 speeds, I use steel front billet bearing retainers on the Super T10 as well. I put the seal in it, it's pressed down flush to the bottom, got the gasket on it, tacked with anaerobic gel on both sides, front and back. I have pre-greased the seal as well, it's very important that you always pre-grease your seals, okay? So when an initial fire up happens, you don't burn out the rubber seal. Also packing grease inside of the seal keeps the spring from popping out if you have to tap on something. So, uses nine bolts on the side cover, four bolts on the front bearing retainer. I use this pump thread locker gel. I use the red thread locker gel on it so that the thread locker kind of stays in place. So I don't have to worry about doing each bolt. I can do them all at once, get them ready to go, and then finish putting this unit together. All these bolts get torqued down to 20 foot pounds. I'll always recheck the torque because the gasket sometimes compresses. So just to make sure I'm where I have to be. You want to put thread locker on these bolts for several reasons. Is that oil can leak through the threads since there is an open hole in the back of these bolts. Oil can leak through. So you want to put some thread locker. If you don't want to use thread locker, use sealant. But use something to kind of keep the thread sealed. Now, normally your transmission is going to have a vent over here, so you have a Super T10. There's no reason to remove the vent unless somebody broke it off. But these new transmissions, they come as a bare case. So I have to put a vent on them, and these new vents are these plastic vents. And I don't like just kind of pressing them in and tapping them in. I like to put a little 
JB Weld on them. So I'm mixing up some JB Weld two-part epoxy here just to ensure that it will never come out again. So all you got to do is put a little bit of this on here. Tap the vent gently into the transmission. It's plastic so you don't want to be wailing on it, okay? I'm going to flip this back over. We're going to put the side cover on it and we're pretty much there. So before I put the side cover on in the transmission, I want to show you that I have these one two slider in the second gear position. We use these custom shift forks for the transmission. They work very well. They're a little bit more tighter against the cover than stock forks, so they tend not to flop around. By putting grease on these forks, it'll help keep the forks in position and not drop down. So the cover's in second gear position over here. I've lubed the areas that the fork is going to sit in. I'm going to just put the gasket down now. This is one transmission that I'm actually going to see how it drives. So it's going to be kind of neat to see how the whole package works. So if you tilt it kind of like this, you can kind of guide the forks in. And catch all your bolts. I'm going to be installing the Hurst shifter kit for the 68 through 79 Corvette transmission. It's a universal kit, includes extra rods for reverse because of different rods for the Muncie. Now you've seen me do installations on Hurst shifters before for this particular application. So you can reference the other video. Links will be up in this corner over here. So I'm actually watching the torque wrench right now because what I like about these digital torque wrenches is that I can bring the bolts up little by little and actually watch the readout. So even though I'm doing it quite fast, I'm bringing it up gradually. This is taking, this is gonna go to 20 foot pounds and right now I'm up to about 10, 11, and I'll just bring it around gradually so the gasket compresses gradually. A lot of times if you press this thing down too fast, you can actually split gaskets. So it's always a good idea to bring any type of assembly that you're using gaskets down gradually. So what I always do is sometimes when these shift arms are a little uneven on the transmissions, I want to make sure that the stops are working properly for both the 1-2 and the 3-4, and they are.
these new tail housings, the only metric thread left is this one. It's a six millimeter thread. They did change these back. These used to be a 10 millimeter thread and they changed them back to 7 16ths UNC coarse. Now this should be correct for this guy's 355 rear with a 225 70 15 tire. Also you want to note I've got magnetic fill and drain plugs that I put in this transmission. My hand under it work. So this is the actual Turbo 400 that was taken out of the car and the actual length of the Turbo 400 from the front where it bolts onto the engine to the back of the extension housing is pretty much the same when you combine the Super T10 and the bell housing pressure plate clutch and everything will fit right in the same area so there's actually no modifications that need to be done to the drive shaft So this, this plate has to be changed, the whole thing was changed from the automatic plate yeah. to the, uh, yeah, the, the stiff speed plates here from the automatic. And, and that's this whole plate over here, yep. this whole thing here. Yep. And then you just got to put the... Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah this, the, the, we'll never survive coming off the other plate. I got a new one over here on Monday. Mm -hmm. I kind of wasn't sure what it needed. Looks really nice. Yeah, it's, uh, Pedals all look factory. Yeah, it's all factory stuff.
And it's at a 355 gear, so you feel it really accelerates nice in first gear. Yes, e you haven't to go. really pushed it yet. It just takes off nice. Right. A couple of gears feel really good. try to do is I try to like actually burnish the rings in and pre-break them in, in in the shop and that's done by pretty much like just uh, polishing the cones of the gears and working the rings in actually before because when they're new they'll stick to the gears and lock up yeah, yeah it's the um no, it's really it's nice the clutch is real nice it's smooth no chatter you know they Adjustment came out real nice. This was a this was an awesome job. It was a lot of fun working with. You know, by the way, I meant to say, we've known each other and worked with each other for about 25 years. You realize that? More, yeah. yeah. yeah more. Like that. I used to do the Corvette overdrives yeah. <laughs> and ship them down when I was up in New York. Absolutely. And oddly, I'm right around the corner from back, you now. Back in Jupiter. Right. And you know, it's really great. It was a fun project. Yeah. And you did a great job on the training. It's beautiful. See you next time, guys. All right.